I'm extremely honored and excited to uh, have the chance to present my friend Tony Miola into the National Soccer Hall of Fame. I've been lucky enough to know Tony on many different levels for the last 35 years. We've been opponents, rivals, teammates, friends, and brothers. And I've also been lucky enough to be his goalkeeper coach during some of those years. I feel that gives me a unique perspective on Tony, who we've all watched and admired performing on an international stage for close to 20 years. Tony has had hundreds of teammates in his career, and many of them are here today sharing in his honor. Of all of Tony's teammates, none have been lucky enough as I have to be his teammate in over 500 competitive games in his career. These weren't all soccer games. They also included some baseball, basketball, and football. And I started thinking about what I would say about Tony to shed some light on who he is and what makes him special. And many of those games and seasons entered my mind. I can talk in great detail about some of those memories today, like they just happened. You know, like when he hit 27 home runs in Little League as a 12-year-old, one of those DiMaggio-like records that'll never be broken. Or his first start for the U.S., a 3 nothing win uh, when he was only 20 years old. Or as an eighth grader playing football when he was kicking 50-yard field goals. The 1993 U.S. Cup game versus England that was in the video there. I'm sure Ian Wright is still having nightmares about that match. Uh, senior year sectional championship, Tony hit a home run in the top of the seventh inning, the last inning to win the game. The 1989 NCAA final at Rutgers versus Santa Clara, a national championship for Tony in Virginia. Um, I still haven't gotten over how cold it was to sit there that day. I think it was close to minus 20 windshield. The last four qualifying games for the 90 World Cup, four straight shutouts, and uh, if a goal had been scored in any of those games, all of us probably wouldn't be sitting here today. The one game playoff where Tony joined the national team again for a while in 2002 versus Grenada um, to qualify for that great run in the quarterfinals. I think it was a 0-0 game at halftime, game that the U.S. had to win. Tony made huge, two huge saves early in the second half before the United States went on to win 4-0, to qualify, and make that great run in 2002. The 1986 game, I think it was 86, versus the Celtic boys who used to come to Kearney every year and, and just destroy everybody. But that year was different. You know, they brought over a team that I think many became professionals in Scotland with Celtic. And Tony just had one of those nights. It was a 0-0 tie, but he looked like he was playing in front of those, one of those little pug goals. I mean, he must have made 25 saves that game. Uh, the buzzer beater in basketball against Westfield, you know, where we were down one with like three seconds left and the coach draws up a play and didn't include Tony. I was inbounding the ball and we're walking out on the court. And Tony looks at me and goes, you know, just throw the ball up as high as you can down the floor and I'll catch it. So, I, you know, I looked back at the coach and I looked at Tony and he had that look in his eye like he knew what he was doing more than the coach did. So... <laughs> I did. I hurled the ball down the court as far as I can. He rose up and between two trees, caught the ball, turned around, and hit it from about 30 feet to win the game at the buzzer. You know, I thought about Tony's last season as a professional. I think it was 2007, 2008 with New Jersey Ironman when things kind of came full circle for him and I. And I was lucky enough to be the goalkeeper coach and broadcaster for the team that season. And I saw Tony at 38 years old, surrounded mostly by kids just out of high school or college, treating his craft and the sport with great respect, as he always has. Warm-ups wouldn't start until about 10 a.m., and some of the younger kids would be running into the facility at 9.50, shoving Burger King breakfast down their throat. But Tony was on the field by 9.30, working on his footwork drills, banging balls off the boards, catching them, working on his hands, basically treating what ended up as his final year as a professional, like he did when he was preparing for World Cups. It was a lesson for those younger players, and hopefully they learned from it on what it takes to be a Hall of Famer. When I think of Tony and all the amazing athletic accomplishments, I think of three things, and some of the guys that he played with mentioned them in the video. Number one, I think of a winner. Number two, I think of a great teammate. And number three, I think of a great friend. I want to share two final stories that hopefully give a little more insight on what it's been like to know Tony all these years. And why, when I think of him, I think of those three things. Winner, great teammate, and great friend. 
The first story is from the 94 World Cup, and it talks to the point of Tony being a winner. It was June 21st, the day before the U.S. would play Colombia. The team everyone had picked to win the group easily, and some felt could go all the way and win the cup. The U.S. was just finishing practice, and I was watching the practice with a friend of mine, and assistant coach Steve Sampson was hanging around, and, and I asked him how he felt about our chances in that game tomorrow. And Coach Sampson looked up and glanced over to where Tony was still working on some footwork and some hand drills. And Coach Sampson said, as long as we have the big guy over there, I love our chances. Sampson walked away and my friend said to me, is he crazy? We've got no shot tomorrow. He has to say that, right? And my friend was never lucky enough to be teammates with Tony, so he couldn't understand what Coach Sampson was talking about. But Alexi did. Uh, you know, we, I knew exactly what he meant. And the next day, the U.S., led by Captain Miola, went out and shocked the world with a 2-1 win in front of about 94,000 people at the Rose Bowl. I think it was only a 90th minute goal by a Columbia player that uh, prevented the shutout that day. And Tony, I think we saw a couple of those big saves that you made while the game was still in doubt. My last story I want to talk about speaks to the character of Tony Miola and how he was always a great teammate and a great friend. It was the summer of seventh grade, and up until that point, we had always kind of been rivals. We were never teammates. Since we were both goalkeepers, we always played on different travel soccer teams growing up. Well, this summer, we both made the New Jersey State team together as the goalkeepers, and it was the first time I got a chance to experience what it was like having him as a teammate and a friend. I think the first games we ever played together was at a regional tournament, I believe at East Stroudsburg University. And the state teams from New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Connecticut, were there to play against each other. And the, the first game comes and Coach Tom Carney points to me and he says, you have first game, and he points to Tony and he says, you have second game. I don't think he was able to tell the two of us apart. We both had the beginner mullet haircuts. We both wore clothes that our moms, you know, shopped in the Husky department. And we were both about six feet tall at that age. Tony hasn't grown, I have. So as we're walking to the goal, Tony looks at me and he says, when I start shooting on you, look at my eyes. So I get in the goal and Tony looks to one corner. And he fires a rocket in the upper 90, where he just was looking. To this day, I've still never seen a 12-year-old hit a shot as hard as he could. Well, I picked the ball up out of the back of the net, and he does this a few more times. And it was kind of like Ralph Cramden style. He was giving me the big eyes, <laughs> tilting his head before he would hit the next blast from 12 yards away, and I finally caught on. And I started flying around making saves that I'd never made in my life before. I had a confidence in the goal that I'd never felt thanks to this warm-up. And Tony had me thinking I was one of our idols at the time. Hubert Berkemeyer, Shep Messing, Dino Zoff. After the game, I asked Tony what that warm-up was all about. And he said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, some of the coaches who picked the regional team were watching, and I wanted you to put on a good show. A couple of things entered my mind immediately. The first one was, how the hell does he even know there's a regional team? I guarantee you not one other 12-year-old knew a regional team even existed. I don't know if Coach Carney knew a regional team existed. But it was always Tony's goal, even at that age, to represent his state, his region, and his country playing soccer. And even though that was his goal at the time, and we played the same position, he wanted me to put on a show while the regional coaches were watching our warm-up. Right then and there, I knew what a great teammate and a great friend that I would have for the rest of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's truly my honor to present to you a winner, a great teammate, a great friend, and a true pioneer at the goalkeeping position, the greatest U.S. goalkeeper that we now have in our National Soccer Hall of Fame, Tony Miola.
Um, <clears throat> first, I want to thank Sunil um, and Dan Flynn, U.S. Soccer, for everything you do. And Hank, um, you know, I'm still speechless, but they tell me I have to say something. So uh, I appreciate everything from the Hall of Fame induction committee. Um, it's an honor to be on this ballot for sure. I want to say thank you to everybody that voted. Um, I'd like to personally congratulate Tony DeChico, a friend, someone who shares the same passion that I do in the goal. Uh, Desmond Armstrong, a great teammate. Uh, you will never be forgotten. Um, but more importantly, Desmond was a guy uh, who showed a lot of us at a young age what it was like to be a professional. So thank you. Claudio uh, Reyna, a kid who I grew up watching I came up through the ranks in New Jersey. I had the pleasure to be his captain in the, the 1994 World Cup. Eight years later, I had the honor of being on the 2002 World Cup team that, that Claudio was the captain of. Uh, today, our thoughts and prayers are with Claudio and his family for sure. Uh, being part of the Hall of Fame was, was never a mission of mine um, growing up. Quite honestly, I, I didn't know uh, what it was. I didn't know what it meant to an athlete. When I eventually learned more about it, um, I had no idea how to get there. I was just a kid doing what I loved to do, uh, playing soccer in Kearney, New Jersey, trying to follow in the footsteps of great players like John Harks and Tab Ramos. Uh, now that I've reached this point, I find myself honored and, and humbled by this entire experience. <clears throat> As I began preparing for today, I was able to reflect back on, on so many great things that have happened in my life and all the great people uh, that have been in my life because of the sport of soccer. I'm forever indebted to so many of you. I could never, never fully repay you, uh, but I will try today in just a small way. Um, every athlete gets motivated in different ways. For me, the thrill of coming out uh, for warm-ups and seeing the stadium begin, begin to fill up and, and know that when you got out there the stadiums would be full um, with fans just was a, was a high for me that I could never explain. Um, so I want to thank all the fans that for so many years supported me, encouraged me, and pushed me to want to be better. Um, I especially want to thank the fans of Kansas City that for seven years of my life gave me and my family more support. Uh, believe me, it's not easy for a kid from New Jersey to move to Kansas City. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm honored to have shared an MLS Cup as well as Lamar Hunt Open Cup uh, with you, and it's something I'll cherish forever. I also want to thank, obviously, the fans in the New Jersey area for your support and your passion of the game for so many years. Even though the job was never finished, um, it goes without saying that I wanted to win a championship in my hometown um, more than anyone. And although that, that mission still remains the same, I want to say thank you for the memories. Uh, you will always be my home crowd for sure. <clears throat> I want to thank the media by whom I was always treated fairly uh, for 20 years of a professional career. Thank you for fighting, uh, for media time, for fighting for space uh, in newspapers, um, especially in the early days, as Paul mentioned, when uh, no one seemed to want to cover our game. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, every athlete has their fir first interview at some point, and we do thousands of them over the years. Mine came, uh, I still remember it, and it came in 1987 in Rio de Janeiro on a bus ride back um, from a youth national team game that we just lost against Brazil. And for that experience, I want to thank Michael Lewis, who I know is here somewhere today, um, for being part of that and continuing his support uh, of our sport. As a player, your greatest wish always is to go to a stadium and know that you have a great organization, great coaches, and great teammates. They either make or break your career. Um, and in my case, I couldn't be, couldn't have been any more blessed. Um, so to all the coaches, I've learned something from each and every one of you. 
hopefully I didn't, I didn't drive you. I know Coach Ganser will probably uh, disagree, but hopefully I didn't drive you crazy uh, along the way trying to convince you that I was a center forward. I'm just trapped in this goalkeeper's body. <laughs> um, uh, John Miller, who I know is here somewhere today, um, Michael Russick, my high school soccer coaches, who taught me what it meant to be a, be a part of a winning program at Kearney High School at such a young age. To my high school baseball coach, who, Jimmy Sam Flippo, who drilled into my head the one saying that I never let escape me my entire career. That saying was simple, but for me essential if I was going to be successful. And that saying was winners win. Thank you, Jimmy. And there are so many coaches in my career that have influenced uh, this path to get here today. Bora Militinovic, my 1994 World Cup coach, Afonso Mondello, Ralph Perez, John Kowalski, Dave Sarakin, <clears throat> and Bob Bradley, who gave me an opportunity to come back to New Jersey at the end of my career uh, to play. To my goalkeeper coaches, especially Tim Mulqueen and Militin Sholey Sovskic, we shared the love of the game on a daily basis. We worked for so many hours together just for the same goal. Um, I appreciate your support and thank you for um, pushing me when I didn't think I could dive again. Um, I share this with you. To Coach Gansler, my coach in the 90 World Cup, and for those two championships in Kansas City, and the first coach to believe in me and give me a chance with the national team, thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And lastly, Bruce Arena, my career, as most people know, started and ended with Bruce. It also had a, a lot of great years and great memories in between. He taught me so much about the game of soccer when he brought me to the University of Virginia, where he treated me like a son, all the way through the national team, where he allowed me to earn my 100th cap with the national team, where he treated me like a man. Thank, thank you, Bruce, and thank you to your family. <clears throat> Most athletes never really get a, a chance to be part of an organization with an owner that cares more about your family, your personal life, and your character, seemingly more than he does about any of the results that you've ever had. I played for one owner like that, who had a profound had a profound effect on my, myself, excuse me, and everyone in our locker room. I'm sorry. He always warned me not to use his name because it wasn't about him. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the impact on my life. The late Mr. Lamar Hunt. He was a gentleman, a role model in every sense of the word. And through his actions, he taught us all about humility. Thank you for your lessons and your support, Mr. Hunt. <clears throat> to my teammates, after 20 years of playing, there's there are so many to name. I want to say thank you to all of you. 16 of you that I will forever share a spot in the Hall of Fame. And surely there are so many more to join in the future. I enjoyed every minute we spent together trying to figure out how to win games. Most of the names you know, and here are a few, Agus, Balboa, Clavijo, Dooley, Doyle, Eichmann, Henderson, Johnston, Jones, Kinnear, Klein, Lawless, Masoner, Max Moore, Molnar, Murray, Perez, Precky, Savaresi, Stewart, David Van Oli, Vermees, Winishman, Winald, and Zavagnin. And then, of course, there's those who push me every day. Jurgen Sommer, Zach Thornton, Brad Friedel, Casey Keller, and Tim Howard. And of course, my two Carney Thistle teammates, John Harks and Tab Ramos. There are also some names you won't recognize, but helped mold my career as much as any. Arena Mullins, Monroe, Galka, McCord, O'Neill, Gutierrez, and of course, Sal Rosemilia. 
Thank you for your help and your support. I also want to thank a special group of boys. Um, they're a current U15 um, soccer team. Players that I've had the pleasure to coach for the last five years. It's a bit scary, and I know I spoke to Hank about this uh, a while back, but when I didn't have a place in the game, there was a few months in my life where I wanted nothing more than to walk away. <clears throat> and I had the opportunity to coach an 11-year-old boys team uh, that included my son, Jonathan. That group of boys gave me more reasons to love this beautiful game. I ever imagined existing. Thank you for the opportunity to coach you. Finally, <clears throat> this will be easy. <laughs> and I want to thank the most important people and special people in my life. My mom, Maria, my dad, Vincent, my sister, Angela. Talk about being there from the start. I can never, ever repay you for what you've done. Thank you for everything. The best way I think I can think of for repaying you would be to pass along the lessons that I've learned from you onto my own kids. Thank you, and I love you. During my career, there were so many highs and so many lows. There were days when things were headed in the right direction, and there were things when it was just a bad day. But when I would open the door, there was one thing that was for sure that made me smile, and that was my kids. So to Jonathan, Kylie, and Aiden, I am proud of you and the people you are becoming. Like I always tell you, you can do whatever you set your mind to. I'm your biggest fan. And last, <laughs> But not certainly least, in order to be successful, everyone needs a rock in their life. Someone who can deal with the pressures, the ups, the downs, and make sure the kids are taken care of and the family is in order. My wife, Colleen, is my rock and the love of my life. I love you more than words can explain. Like Desmond, you are my legacy. So thank you for always being there for me. I love you. I want to say thank you. It's a great honor and it is my pleasure to be part of this entire class and the rest of the Hall of Fame. Thank you very much.